welcome to our podcast on how structural racism is codified and used as a mechanism to control and deprive black children and families of their rights and opportunities. In this series, we will be exploring the ways in which deeply embedded systems of racism and discrimination have been used to perpetuate a cycle of trauma and injustice in black communities. We will examine the ways in which the education, criminal justice, and child welfare systems, among others, have been used to control and oppress black children and families, often with devastating consequences. Through interviews with experts, advocates, and members of the impacted communities, we will unpack the ways in which structural racism is codified and how it manifests in everyday life for black children and families. We will also explore the root cause of these systems and the ways in which they are being challenged and dismantled by those working toward equity and justice. It is our hope that this podcast will serve as a tool for education and empowerment and that it will inspire listeners to take action towards creating a more just society for black children and families. Thank you for joining us on this journey. You all don't want to work with me? I'll take them now. We'll be done with this. You think the judge is going to believe you, or you think the judge is going to believe me with your history? You guys make lies. Oh, honey, I don't make oh, lies. Oh, yeah, you do. Well, You're not coming in this house. Oh, well, then I'm taking your kids. Babe, you need to come here now. Yeah, Jerry needs to get his ass out here. How many kids are in there? Your kids ain't staying here. Hi, honey. You ain't oh. taking my fucking kids. Oh, I'll take them. So you want to, I'm telling Are we you. going there? No, she ain't going in there. That house, we don't know if that house is safe. Hey. Jerry, get here now! Listen. Kids in danger are often removed from their homes by governmental agencies, but is the system fair? Philip Palmer with a controversial new remedy, the blind removal solution. Racial disproportionality has been a long-standing issue within child welfare services. Black children account for only 7% of the general population in L.A. County, but 24% of the children in foster care are black. White children account for 20% of the general population, but only 11% of children in foster care. I don't want to be a, 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 a part of a civilized society or government where systems cause more harm to already fragile people or fragile communities. And so we really have to turn this system on its head. In an effort to address similar numbers, child welfare workers in Nassau County, New York, conducted a five-year study to test what's called a blind removal process. A caseworker does not disclose the race, name, or location to describe a family. Instead, they only provide information about current and past allegations and risk factors. With the information left out that could identify the family's race, the test study is said to have found the most significant decrease in racial disproportionality within the Nassau County system ever. LA County now plans to test blind removal, working with Dr. Tyrone Howard of UCLA Pritzker Center for Strengthening Children and Families to pilot the program at at least one regional DCFS office. It's not the end-all, be-all if it works. There are a number of different tools that can be used, that should be used, and some are being used to reduce racial disproportionality. We just want to study to see if blind removal can cause just one family, two families, to remain intact. This is not a simple solution. There are those who worry blind removals will make it harder for social workers to do their jobs because of the additional time needed. Another concern with blind removals, would it provide an opportunity for caseworkers to show their own bias since they control all of the information given to the committee? We have to try something because the bottom line is there are far too many black children who are being taken from their families, and that is unacceptable. So we have to be creative, we have to be innovative, and we have to look at any kind of effort that we know may have some success. David Green is a DCFS social worker and says if this idea shows promise here, 
it would certainly be possible in smaller communities. Los Angeles County is the largest child welfare system in the entire United States. So if there's ever a place to look at how we de decrease these racial disparities, L.A. County is the place, and now is the time. Tonight, I'm talking about those children removed from their homes intentionally for profit. CPS has redefined poor to mean psychologically inferior. Therefore, it is in the best interest of the child to be removed. Best interest, of course, has also been redefined at the child's expense. It has been reported over and over that six times as many children die in foster care than in the general public. Once a child is legally kidnapped and placed in official safety, the child is far more likely to suffer abuse, including sexual molestation and or rape. If you have a child, if you know somebody that has a child, any parents, please tag them in this video. Guys, if DHS or Child Protective Services ever comes to your home to question you or ask you questions or try to enter your home, I want you to know that when you let them into your home, you give them jurisdiction. Keep their ass outside, okay? Now, that's number one. Number two, you guys think that they're coming because a teacher told them something or because a neighbor said something or somebody whispered something bad about your home and how you're raising your child. I have news for you. All of My name is Nancy Schaefer, and um, I'm from the state of Georgia. Uh, I will share with you on the unlimited power of Child Protective Services. I served in the Georgia State Senate, and after four years of viewing the ruthless and unsparing actions of Child Protective Services, also called CPS, which I will use tonight, I wrote a scathing report entitled, The Corrupt Business of Child Protective Services. <laughs> Thank you. The report cost me my Senate seat. Here's some copies of the report, if you'd like to get one. What you are going to view for the next 70 seconds are the pages of the document and letter that Senator Schaefer sent to Congress for oversight and review of the Department of Child Protective Services, calling it calling their work legal kidnapping. So if you have a chance, look up these documents and understand exactly what it was that Senator Schaefer said about the Child Protective Services Department. What happens to Saisha Mercado and her family happens all too often. Racial disparities exist at every level of the child welfare system. Black families are more likely to be reported to child abuse hotlines and investigated for child abuse and neglect. And as a result, they're more likely to have their children removed from their care. So it's no surprise that more than a quarter of children nationally in foster care are black. In big cities like Chicago and New York, more than 95% of children in foster care are black and brown. I'm glad to be joined by ten, uh, or joined tonight by Dorothy Roberts, a professor of law and sociology at the University of Pennsylvania Law School and author of Torn Apart, How the Child Welfare System Destroys Black Families and How Abolition Can Build a Safer World. Welcome to the show, Dorothy. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'd like to first get your reaction of the video showing police taking Saisha Mercado's baby from the side of a road. 
Well, it's a horrifying video. It shows extreme dehumanization of this couple, ripping a newborn baby from her mother's arms is an extreme form of terror on families. And it also shows the way in which the law enforcement in America works hand in hand with so-called child protection. They're both, in my opinion, forms of terror and oppression of black people and they work together. We should think about them in the same light, just as we're protesting police killings and other forms of violence against black people, we should be protesting this kind of violence against black families. That happens all the time. And it has happened for decades. And I would trace it even back to the slavery era and the separation of black families mm -hmm. when we were enslaved people. Mm -hmm. Now, Saisha's first baby was taken away from her when a doctor at Johns Hopkins Hospital called CPS because they claimed the baby was malnourished, um, when in fact the baby was having trouble transitioning from breastfeeding to solids, which is a common issue for new mothers. Explain the role that white doctors, teachers, and other people we entrust our children to for care play in this process. Well, the decision whether or not to call a child abuse hotline is a very subjective one. There are people, professionals, who come in contact with children, like doctors, police officers, social service workers, teachers, who are what's called mandated reporters. And they're supposed to report their suspicion of child abuse and neglect. But this is a decision that is rife with racist ideas. And we know that black children are far more likely to be reported by doctors and others for the exact same kinds of behavior or problems that uh, white people also have. Uh, so one example, which was not the case here, is drug use during mm -hmm. pregnancy. There's lots of evidence mm -hmm. that black women are far more likely to be tested and reported than white women are. And this is especially true for impoverished, in impoverished communities, although not just that. That's why racism really is uh, a, a, a significant factor here. We have to think about how racism drives these decisions and also how the child, so-called child welfare system itself is a form of racial oppression. Now, Dorothy, you say that Child Protective Services operates in such a way that it upholds structures put in place during slavery. Um, could you expound on that? Sure. Well, you can see from the video an extreme dehumanization of uh, Ms. Mercado. She was not being treated the way we would expect a mother with a newborn child to be treated. This devaluation of black mothers and the idea that we don't really have strong ties with our children, that it's easy to rip our children away from us, we can trace back to the slavery era where during slavery, slaveholders legally owned you know, I'm talking about according to the law, uh, enslaved black children. And black parents had no legal rights to their children. So there was rampant separation of children from their families. There was absolutely nothing that would prevent a slaveholder from breaking up a family. And that happened often. And so to me, that's the origin of this idea that black families can be torn apart by the state, and also the idea that our bonds with our children aren't really as valuable as bonds between white parents and their children. This is part of the reason why these, these stereotypes about fl black families, why we see this well-documented racism in decision making about reporting and also the decision whether to take a child away from the family or not. Both of those are important decisions and they both are determined by racism in America. What are the
the harms suffered by our black children who are removed from their parents? You know, it's interesting when the Trump administration had its cruel policy of separation of children from their parents mm -hmm. at the border, America began to think about the trauma inflicted on families. Yes. And there were lots of media reports about it and lawsuits about it. And yes, that was a horrible policy that inflicted trauma. But it's the same trauma that's inflicted on black families all the time at far higher rates than uh, what we saw at the border, much larger numbers over a longer period of time. This kind of separation is concentrated in black neighborhoods and the rates of removal are far higher. Also the rates of investigation, you cited some statistics at the beginning, another really important figure is that more than half of black children will be subjected to a child welfare investigation during his or her lifetime, uh, or I should say childhood by the time they're uh, 18 years old. Now, an investigation itself is traumatic. You have caseworkers coming in, they sometimes strip search children, they interrogate them apart from their parents, they search the home, all of this without the protections that would even be given to a, a, a defendant in a criminal case. Parents mm. should be entitled to these pr protections, but caseworkers have this threat that they can take your children away from you. And one thing I'll note in that video, the family had an attorney there. And even with the representation of a, an attorney, the sheriff's deputies and CPS workers still took the child away. Imagine what happens in the vast majority of cases where caseworkers come to the home and the family doesn't even have legal counsel and they're being threatened and there may, there may be police officers accompanying the caseworker. It's a terrifying situation compounded even more when you take children away from their loved ones and put them in a foster care system, which we know is also harmful to children. So this is a traumatizing terroristic system. And I am glad that you and others are, and this family are exposing it to America because it needs to be abolished. And we need a radically different way of dealing with human needs and families' needs and ways of keeping children safe without this brutal way of tearing families apart. Dorothy Roberts, professor of law and sociology at the University of Pennsylvania Law School and author of Torn Apart, How the Child Welfare System Destroys Black Families and How Abolition Can Build a Safer World. Thank you so much for your expertise tonight. Next up, our weekly series on black and missing women and girls. However, there are causes worth losing over. And this is one. I'm going to uh, uh, talk about some of the problems and then some realistic maybe solutions uh, for families and children and uh, maybe look to some steps that we can take. This is not to say that there are not those children in wretched situations who need to be removed. There are, and we all agree. But tonight, I'm talking about those children removed from their homes intentionally for profit. Children are seized unnecessarily from their families due to the federal aid created in 1974 entitled the Adoption and Safe Families Act. It offers financial incentives to the states that increase adoption numbers. To receive the adoption incentives, or bonuses, local CPS must have more children. They must have more merchandise to sell. Funding is available when a child is placed in a foster home with strangers or placed in a mental health facility and medicated, usually against the parent's wishes. Parents are victimized by the system that makes a profit for holding children longer and bonuses for not mature returning children to their parents. This is abuse of power. It is lack of accountability. And it is a growing, 
criminal political phenomenon spreading around the globe. Mila Jackson was born on March 21st in DeSoto, six pounds, nine ounces. The midwife helped with a successful home birth. Three days later, her parents, Rodney and Tamisha Jackson, took her to a pediatrician for a standard checkup. They say they got a clean bill of health and took the baby back home. Then they got messages from the doctor that the baby had jaundice, dangerously high levels of bilirubin. The parents told them that with the help of their midwife, they would treat the baby on their own. Several hours later into the night, he texts my phone, the very aggressive, take her to the hospital or he's calling CPS. And that's what he did. Dr. Anand Bhatt telling the court, I authorized the support of CPS to help get this baby the care that was medically necessary and needed. And Child Protective Services agreed, writing, due to the parents being unwilling to discuss the danger and potential consequences of this condition, it is necessary for the department to intervene. DeSoto police helped CPS take the baby from them at their home on March 28th. Unlawfully enter my home and come and take my baby from me. But here's an additional problem. The affidavit used to justify CPS taking custody of the child lists the wrong mom, a woman with a completely different name, a woman with a history of neglect, not Tamisha Jackson, the mom who gave birth to me. And so instantly I felt like they had stolen my baby as I had had a home birth, and they are trying to say that my baby belonged to this other woman. We've been treated like criminals, um, and that's far from the truth. This is a nightmare that I wouldn't wish on anyone. We're demanding that Mila be returned home today, today, because yesterday was too late. CPS, meanwhile, says it can't comment on the case. The infant has been placed with a foster family and two distraught parents have been told to wait until a next court hearing in two more weeks. In Dallas, I'm Kevin Reese. Now, we did reach out to Baylor Scott and White, uh, which said in part in respect of patient privacy, it is inappropriate to provide comment on this. A couple hasn't had custody of their children for a month now. This all stems from a traffic stop on their way to a funeral in Chicago. Teresa Bowles spoke to the father and his lawyer to find out how they're working to get their children back. Five children taken away while one of them were still breastfeeding. That's Deontay Williams' lawyer, Courtney Teasley. Here are some pictures of Williams with his children. Williams lives in Snellville, and the children's mother, Bianca Claiborne, lives in Lawrenceville. According to the district attorney's previous news release on February 17th, Williams and Claiborne were traveling with their children through Coffee County, Tennessee. Williams' arrest warrant shows Tennessee Highway Patrol troopers stopped them originally for tinted windows and traveling in the left lane while not actively passing. Both are facing simple possession charges. The district attorney says Williams was arrested and released on a $2,500 bond, but Bianca was never taken into custody and issued a court summons instead. Eventually, the Tennessee Department of Children's Services took custody of the five children. This family has been without their babies. I can't imagine my life without my babies. I reached out to Tennessee District Attorney Craig Northcott, the Tennessee Department of Children's Services, and the Tennessee Highway Patrol several times today. None of them responded. Here's Department of Children's Services Director of Communications, Alex Dennis, talking with reporters in Tennessee earlier this week. We talk about transparency a lot, whether that be policy, procedure, protocol, and in this case, we feel like those case managers did just that. Dennis says DCS collects evidence just like law enforcement. After the evidence is presented in court, the judge makes the final decision, then DCS follows through. Williams tells me he has been able to see his kids since they were taken away. He says they're with a family friend for now. TZ wants to advise everyone that the family has now set up a GoFundMe account, so don't be fooled by any online fundraisers. They do not have one. The lawyer is accepting donations for anyone who wants to help the family. Their contact information is on 11alive.com. In April 2021, a call was made to the police regarding a dispute at the foster home of 16-year-old Micaiah Bryant. 911, what's your emergency? We got Indies grown girls over here trying to fight us, trying to stop us, trying to put our hands on our grandma. Get here now! Police arrived at the scene and shot Bryant four times, killing her. A black girl who was defending herself with a knife. What does the chaos leading up to the shooting death of Micaiah Bryant tell us about black kids in the welfare system? These babies deserve to feel safe. Today's baggage, how foster care fails black kids. 
The child welfare system is a set of services that support children and families to make sure that they have a safe and adequate space to live and grow. Well, supposedly. Child welfare consists of programs like housing assistance, parenting skills classes, and foster care, which sets up a system where children can be separated from parents that are deemed unfit. Hollywood has glorified the experiences of kids in foster care with multiple iterations of Orphan Annie. But unlike my forever Annie, portrayed by Quaventine Wallace, the reality is that most black kids in the system don't have that fairy tale ending. In 2018, black children represented 14% of the kids in the US, but 23% of all kids in foster care. And just like so much else in this country, in order to get an idea of exactly how the child welfare system got this way, we've got to take it back. I start by going all the way back to slavery and the enslavement of black families in the United States because during that system, white enslavers put themselves in the position of being in control of the entire plantation family, which included Black parents and children. Dorothy Roberts is a professor of law, Africana studies, and sociology at the University of Pennsylvania. Roberts is also the author of Shattered Bombs, The Color of Child Welfare. On the auction block, families were often put up for sale and children sold off to other enslavers separate from the mothers and fathers. And even after emancipation, the separation of black families was still a thing. Take a look at apprenticeship, for example. In this practice, kids were sent away to work for other families. There was rampant apprenticeship of black children by courts who gave these children over, sometimes to their former enslavers. This was very common. And this cruel system of separating children from their families has harmed multiple communities throughout history. In the 1800s, the U.S. government took thousands of indigenous youth from their families as a form of psychological warfare, putting the kids in boarding schools with the intention of whitewashing them. Roberts also notes orphan trains as a significant forerunner to our current child welfare system. This practice sent hundreds of thousands of homeless, poor, white immigrant children from major cities like New York to the Midwest to work on farms in exchange for room and board. In the early 20th century, the federal government finally decided that it wanted to save the children. Some of the first federal proposals were instituting a national foster care system, expanding adoption agencies, and providing monetary aid through mother's pensions to keep these families intact. The mother's pensions were for white widows or white women without husbands. Black women were left high and dry from the greater child welfare movement until the civil rights movement, that is. Free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Part of the civil rights movement was to extend social welfare, which included Social Security, you know, and, and Medicaid and Medicare and other kinds of public benefits to support families from which Black people have been excluded. And so what happens is when Black families began to be included in child welfare services, these programs began to become much more punitive. As black kids were folded into the child welfare system in the 1950s and 60s, more money was designated to foster care, which by nature breaks families apart. What happens as more and more black children enter the child welfare roles is that foster care becomes the major so-called service. And we see an explosion of the foster care population simultaneously with this development of stingier, more stigmatized welfare benefits up to the basic abolition of the federal entitlement to welfare. So social programs of public benefits to support families from which Black people have been excluded. And so what happens is when Black families began to be included in child welfare services, these programs began to become much more punitive. As Black kids were folded into the child welfare system in the 1950s and 60s, more money was designated to foster care, which by nature breaks families apart. What happens as more and more Black children enter the child welfare roles is that foster care becomes 
the major so-called service. And we see an explosion of the foster care population simultaneously with this development of stingier, more stigmatized welfare benefits up to the basic abolition of the federal entitlement to welfare. So social programs that were once used to support white families are now used to control black families. And those same programs disproportionately regulate and investigate black families too. Robert says that part of this disparity is due to the racist ideology that black mothers were harming their children. And this damaging and problematic way of thinking is a weapon still being used against black parents and families today. We can go back to slavery as the origins of this idea that white people need to save black children from their families. And from the beginning, it's been not only a false, but a racist white supremacist ideology that paints black parents and families and communities as if they're defective and harmful. And so it really twists completely, you know, in the opposite direction what the child welfare system is really about. Rather than being proactive, child welfare has become reactive. The federal government spends 10 times as much money on foster care as it does on reunification. And let's not even start to discuss the preventative services that could be used to prevent children from entering foster care in the first place. And if we really don't want to traumatize kids, then perhaps we should be considering programs aside from foster care. Because by all accounts, foster care is grim. There are questions about the death of a child who is in San Diego County foster care. The child's grandmother tells WBZ's I team that the system failed that girl. There's lots of studies that show all the bad outcomes for children in foster care. They're more likely to be incarcerated, to be in juvenile detention, less likely to go to college, more likely to live in poverty. Whatever outcome you're looking at, foster care makes it worse for children. And instead of changing our society to ensure that Black children have the resources they need, the child welfare system takes children away from their parents on grounds that their parents are neglecting them. They are already marginalized, stigmatized families. I really think this is not so much about the biased motivations of caseworkers as the way the whole system is structured. Makaya Bryant was a 16-year-old who laid her edges on TikTok like many young Black girls. She was a sister and a daughter and a friend, but ultimately was a Black teenager who was entangled in the child welfare system. How does Makaya Bryant, being a Black girl in foster care, shape the way that we understand the tragedy that happened on April 20th, 2021? We have to ask why she was in foster care and the conditions of foster care. Many Black children, especially teenagers, are put in congregate types of care where there are lots of children who have been put together in traumatizing and stressful situations. If you are thrown together with other teens and adolescents, who have been taken from their families, it's not surprising that there would be a fight between children in foster care. It happens all the time. And in many of the cases, law enforcement is called in. Black children in America are already at higher risk of having encounters with law enforcement, being arrested, being detained in juvenile facilities, being in prison, in fact, being imprisoned as adults. So when you add to that the way in which foster care makes them even more vulnerable, that makes their situation worse than that of white children. Structural racism and racial biases in child welfare increase the likelihood that Black families will be separated. While in some cases this does protect children, many times it traumatizes the children who have become a part of the child welfare system or even puts them in danger. Let there be no ambiguity. Makaya Bryant's death is due to multiple failures in the American system, from policing to foster care, which put her in a situation where she had to defend herself with a knife. 
while child welfare and foster care literally break families apart. It isn't hyperbolic to say that the child welfare system itself is broken. Welfare workers are trained to treat each child as an individual. Every effort is made to duplicate a normal, happy home life. Oftentimes, but not always, poor parents are targeted to lose their children because they do not have the wherewithal to hire an attorney or fight the system. Being poor and lacking proper housing does not mean your children should be removed. CPS has redefined poor to mean psychologically inferior. Therefore, it is in the best interest of the child to be removed. Best interest, of course, has also been redefined at the child's expense. I don't think I could ever be a normal mom without having to think about the department. I'm walking on eggshells, and I don't think that's how you're supposed to live, you know, as a parent. What DCFS doesn't realize is that when they take these children from their parents, they're not just separating the child from the parent, they're separating the parent from the child. It's trauma on both ends. It was scary because I didn't know how to react to it. They're kidnapping my son. That's the way I looked at it. The primary reason for child welfare involvement is neglect. which is a broad, very amorphously defined concept that basically conflates with poverty and these conditions that are related to poverty, such as homelessness, right, such as lack of access to child care, um, such as food insecurity. All these things are being criminalized, right, um, by a system that does not provide the solutions to those conditions, but rather takes families through an entire court process of prosecution um, that oftentimes leads to um, trauma, disruption, and actual destruction of family ties. I love you. Thank you. I love you, too. All right, you going to have a good day? All right, high five. All right. My life before DCFS involvement was great. Every day was full of laughter and definitely loudness. We would do our turn up hour and then we would uh, dance and we sing and have a bunch of little party turn up really quick before bed. DCFS asked me to drug test and I tested positive for marijuana, of course, because I use it medicinally. And at that time, the judge said, we're going to make the children ward of the state, but they'll stay in your care. Are you excited to see your kids? Yeah. How do you feel every Thursday when you're going to see them? Um, I'm usually happy and sad at the same time. Court-ordered supervision, or sometimes called family maintenance, is a very invasive and very intrusive government intervention into the privacy of the family. One likes talking. The social worker was making me upset because she would pop up at my kid's school. She would pop up at my house and I'd be in the middle of cooking dinner and she'd be like, can you turn the dinner off? I started to get frustrated. You're coming here every two weeks. You're stopping my day. Now you want to do a walkthrough. You want me to undress the kids. You want to take my children in the rooms, interrogate them and ask them very inappropriate questions. That is very, very inappropriate. If you're looking for a reason to say there's some risk, if you keep looking, uh, you could probably find something in any family. They can take note of many small things, and there's just so much discretion for the caseworker to come in and decide. For me, it's defamation of character, because in those reports, when I read them, 
it feels like I'm reading a story about someone else. When they come to your house, they perceive you as a people, not as an individual. You're Eleanor, you're black. You must have problems and you need our help. Because best believe, if you've got money, DCFS won't knock on your door because you just hand them a card to your lawyer. You've got that whole day of November 1st, right? I sent my kids to school in their Halloween costumes. Three o'clock when I went to pick up my kids from the bus, they didn't get off. I will never forget that feeling. Cause I knew then that they took my kids without me knowing. No one called me to tell me they took my children from me. No one gave me a paperwork, no one gave me a warrant, no one gave me anything. When the police and the ambulance got to my home, the father was gone. I met initially with a DCF investigator who questioned me, asked me what happened. From there on, it was, a lot of it is a blur because it was so traumatizing. Within the week, I had already lost custody of the kids and I wasn't allowed to go back to the hospital to see my son. So once the court took temporary custody, the kids were placed into the foster system. The legal removal from her care happened while she was at the hospital and without a full discussion of what it was. Nobody explained to me anything of the order of temporary custody. Nobody explained to me the petition to terminate my parental rights. Wait, yes. yeah. and remember, she didn't have a lawyer yet at that point. So in those moments, the parent really has no leverage, no ability to negotiate, and no one to tell them, other than the agency, what's going on and what are the variables. I love you and have a good day. I love you more. DCF was uh, aware of us because I had a prior case, which I didn't reunify with my children, and Adrian tested positive for uh, drugs from his pro officer. Supposedly. Automatically, they assumed that I was dirty, and that led to the removal of Maximus. That's all they needed. They said it was the allegation of neglect. So they just painted a picture of their own. At the beginning, we only got to see him, what, twice a week? Our son is getting closer to this other family. And because we're not seeing him as often and as much, he was more quiet, like when we had visits. He, he was more closed off. He wasn't playful with us, though. He wasn't playful with us like he was the foster family. My oldest is the one that gets hit the hardest. His trauma is behavioral, emotionally, anxiety. He suffers from PTSD. They're not protecting our children. They're just giving our children to random people and expecting them to care about our kids the same way we do. September 29th, 2022. Color for today is brown. Boy is... They assigned us requirements to do to, in order to get Max back. Individual therapy sessions, parenting classes, substance abuse classes, along with random color testing. Uh, so today is brown, meaning anybody who was assigned the color brown has to go and uh, do their pee test for drugs. Yeah. Today's not our color, though. Mine's pink and Adrian's is red. 
I completed all my steps before my six months. So what you want me to do, double up everything? I finished it already. I did what I was supposed to, and they still held on to my kids for three years. Often these service plans really have nothing to do with either the issues that brought the family into um, the system or with uh, their needs or their desires or anything that will benefit them. They never ask you what actually helps you. The thing is you're never quite free from them. A poor parent exists in a web of surveillance and expectation and lack. The system spends about 10 times more on investigation, separation, and terminating children's rights and adoption um, than it does on so-called preventive services that would be accessible for parents to avoid having to come into the child welfare system. After your rights are terminated, and then they, they give you one final visit. And when you think about like a final visit with your four year old, or your three year old, it's a really long time. It's a really long time for them to be 18. something completely wrong with their structure of how they go about determining on if a child is really being neglected or if a parent just needs some type of guidance, you know, needs some therapy, needs some, needs some help for the substance abuse class or needs somebody just to talk to because they're depressed. And we're off, Max. We already know that poverty is the main driver. Put that money into communities. We know the zip codes. We know what the conditions of those communities are. As far as what my children have endured in these past three years, it's gonna be a huge adjustment. Them ain't the same kids. Those are traumatized children. Those are children that have been through something. I feel like I'd be the best person to fix all those problems. Would it be easy? No. It's gonna be a hell of a road. Am I ready for it? Yes. Am I willing to take it on? 100%. I gave birth to all those kids, and I would give my life for all those kids. It has been reported over and over that six times as many children die in foster care than in the general public. Once a child is legally kidnapped and placed in official safety, the child is far more likely to suffer abuse, including sexual molestation and or rape. Case workers and social workers are often guilty of fraud. They withhold and destroy evidence and they seek wrongly to terminate parental rights while being protected by state immunity. There is a huge bureaucracy made up of judges, court-appointed attorneys, guardian ad litems, social workers, state employees, court investigators, therapists, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, foster parents, adoptive parents, and on and on, who are looking to the children in state care for their job security. Judges have control over private living arrangements and income of 48.3 million Americans. The United States Census Bureau reported in 2002 that 40 billion in transfer payments were made between households of custody parents and other parents. That money, 40 billion, is under the direction and control of family court judges. In environments, covered with confidentiality laws that protect 
the wrong people. Fathers are victims of this unjust system. Child support payments, even without having visits with their children, are choking the very life out of fathers. Three fathers, of whom I am aware and have been in touch with, committed suicide in the last 12 months because they lost the opportunity to even visit with their children. These are crimes against humanity for financial gain. Rights are removed from parents, human rights, civil rights, and even religious rights. One illustration of what took place in my district is that after so many calls, I decided to call a meeting in one of the counties of my own district. I personally called 37 families from these families. Some children had been taken off the school bus, taken out of the hospitals, or taken out of their homes in the middle of the night, and even worse. It was just an incredible ordeal. These parents, trapped in the system, become like refugees. They're dazed and glazed and have no one of whom to turn. They do not know what to do, and the loss of their children is devastating. After having worked in this arena for several years, I do not believe that a single child comes out whole after having been in this system. Many foster children make up the homeless population of today. I introduced legislation, Senate Bill 415, in my last session. A substitute bill was written at the last minute by the chairman of the Judicial Committee. All the strong points of my bill had been compromised. I was told, accept it, Senator. At least you will get your le some legislation passed. And I answered with, obviously, you do not know me. I did not come to the Capitol to get legislation passed. I came to make a difference. What can be done? An independent audit should be called on every state of all Child Protective Services departments. I'm in touch with congressmen and state officials, and the door may be possibly opening very slowly. A federal congressional hearing is needed. But let me add, due to the hundreds upon hundreds of cases that I've been called to consider, I placed calls to state senators representatives in their respective states across the country asking them to help me with certain families. And I was told if I help that family or if I help you, I will lose my job. Remove, abolish the federal and state financial incentives and those are taxpayer dollars. Those dollars have been turned, have turned CPS into a business that takes children and separates families for money. Open family court, remove the, conf the confidentiality laws, give parents their rights verbally and in writing. I even feel that to terminate the rights of parents, the case should be heard before a jury. Family rights and parents' rights must be protected. We do not need more influence like the UN's Convention on the Rights of the Child. It's anti-parent, anti-child, and anti-common sense for the family. There has to be perseverance for any great reform, and great reform is needed in this area. As Charles Spurgeon put it, how do you tame a lion that is well-fed? First, he must be brought down. Second, his stomach must be lowered. How do you tame Child Protective Services? It may be only by closing it completely and starting over at the beginning with pro-family values. In closing, let me remind you that there is case law from state appellate and federal district courts and up to the United States Supreme Court, all of which affirm the constitutionality of the rights of parents to actually be parents to their children. There's biblical law too. It goes like this, speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. And for the rights of all who are destitute, 
Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Thank you. A lawsuit describes claims of mental, physical, and sexual abuse against boys under the care of Clearwater foster parents. A dozen agencies that are tasked with keeping children safe are named as defendants in that lawsuit. In January, Clearwater police removed nine boys from that Clearwater home. Since then, our Vanessa Ariza has been looking into information about that Clearwater couple who fostered the children. She spoke with three men who said they lived in a home of horrors and a mother whose son was removed months ago. You go into this place and then it, it looks really nice on the outside. It was, I was like, it, it's a mansion. When I first walked in the door, um, they had a pool table, they had video games, they had a workout room, they had all of this cool stuff. These three men had different reasons for being in the foster care system, but the stories they tell about what happened inside this Clearwater home share disturbing similarities. Pretty much hell. Uh, in the beginning, all three reporting little to eat, manual labor from sun up to sundown, and what they thought was only happening to them sexual abuse by their foster father. He was touching my shoulder, and then he, he would say, like, Oh, can you scratch my back? So I would scratch his back and stuff like that, and he would just like try and caress my body and try and touch me. He would touch you, and he would cuddle up with you, and he would he would massage you and and show you pornography. Those same allegations are contained in the 669-page lawsuit filed in Pinellas County. 20 men and children sharing stories about the abuse they endured in the foster home, dating back to 1997. The defendants in this case are large child welfare agencies like the Department of Children and Family Services, Guardians Ad Litem, and the foster parents, Jacqueline and Gerald Logeman. Adam Hecht is representing the plaintiffs. Their stories were so similar. There was a pattern that all of these boys and men had experienced. And then I came to the realization that this is real. Hecht is also representing Crystal Ferreira. Her son recently lived in the home and was removed. I was told very early on that um, he was refusing to see me and that the foster mother didn't um, communicate with the family. She hasn't seen her son since 2018. The lawsuit states he experienced the same abuse as dozens of others had for nearly three decades. According to the lawsuit, children were given little to eat. To get more, they claimed they had to give their foster parents massages. A number of former foster children alleging the foster father would take them to another house where they were sexually abused. This changed me forever. It killed the little Miguel. It killed the little boy. The Logamans obtained an attorney shortly after Clearwater Police removed nine boys from their home in January and began an investigation. That investigation was closed in April after the police said they could not corroborate claims of criminal conduct. Dino Michaels and Renee Palomino are representing the couple. There are multiple people who have these accusations. Would you say they're all lying? I haven't questioned them. I don't know what their motive is. I don't know what their precise statements are. Do you believe that your client is innocent from these accusations? Absolutely, 100%. Like I said, she's an upstanding citizen. She's a model citizen. She's a person who fills a a void in our society helping these children that, that need foster care. Since January, we have requested information from DCF about the foster parents. In total, how many children they fostered and information about the allegations. Initially, DCF released this statement saying in part, the department is launching a review of the licensing process and related concerns of this home with our contracted providers, as well as our own internal processes. Attorneys for the Logaman said DCF also closed its investigation. The Hecht is continuing his filed. fight for dozens of men like those he is representing. So it wasn't just me and, and I was like, okay, well, how do I get into this? How do I, how do I help out with this? Whatever it is, because it's got to stop. I don't want him to ever be in the presence of another child because I don't want nothing, no, nobody to experience what I did. Vanessa Ariza, ABC Action News. You're a victim. Mm. Here we go, CSI. It's really him. It's really him. You're a victim. Mm. Here we go, CSI. 
Some struggle with mental health issues, substance abuse issues, and two have even done time behind bars. I honestly felt like I was going to die. Nathan Williams, aged out of the foster care system, ended up homeless and raped a teenage girl in 2013. He's 25 years old and behind bars at MCI Norfolk. He takes responsibility for his crime, but says the abuse he suffered in foster care is partially to blame. It's hard to look at myself sometimes and, and know what I've done. And I'm sorry for what I've done, truly. And I try to better myself every day because of, uh, because of that. He told us the trauma from what happened to him as a child destroyed him. He would throw us outside in the middle of winter. You know, I'd be naked. And I remember he had this um, big detergent bottle that he filled with water and he put it outside with me while I'm out there shivering naked. And he'd bring me inside and put me in the uh, tub full of ice cubes and make me sit there. And if I moved, then he'd beat me, you know? And then he'd sit there and he'd laugh as he tore the detergent bottle on my head. Take it with a glove and rub it into Nathan's face. In this police report, John said his foster mother's boyfriend smeared dog feces on his brother when Nathan didn't clean up after the family's dogs. Psychiatric records say Nathan was even forced to drink his own urine. The boys said they were both routinely beaten with the metal buckle of a dog leash and more. I remember him hitting my brother so hard, my brother. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. How? My brother looked dead in the face. They're heartless individuals. It wasn't just beaten. He basically treated me like a slave. In the end, it wasn't a teacher, police, or a social worker who stopped the abuse. It was John who, at the age of 12, got off the school bus and kept going, running away from home through the woods to a friend's house and telling all to police. That led to a dozen criminal counts of assault and child endangerment against his foster mother and her live-in boyfriend. The children were never allowed to testify. That's because the prosecutor spoke with the DSS attorney and the social worker and says that they would rather not have the children testify and that the children are in foster homes. So their voices were never heard, the case never went to trial, and the couple struck this deal with the Worcester County District Attorney. As long as they completed probation with no issues, they stayed away from the children, and that the foster mother signed over all the rights to the children, then all of these charges would be dismissed. What's gone through my mind, uh, as I now am a young man, is how disgusting this whole situation was sickening and sickening. And even after John escaped the home and reported the abuse to police, documents show it was several months before DCF removed the remaining foster children from that home. We didn't identify the, the abusers at the center of this case because they were never convicted or criminally charged for most of the allegations. New at 7 tonight, the warning signs of abuse in that home that were missed or overlooked again and again. Kathy Carton, 5 Investigates. Powerful report, Kathy. Thank Five investigates with just a horrific case of abuse that's been kept hidden for years by the state and in court. The abuse, all involving a single foster home in Massachusetts and at least six children, reporter Kathy Kern and producer Kevin Rothstein have worked more than a year to bring this story to light. Kathy. And Ed and Maria, we've done numerous stories about the failures of the state's foster care system. This is another disturbing case. A year and a half ago, a young man reached out to me with a horrifying story of the abuse he, his brother, and other children suffered in a state-licensed foster home. I'm not going to call what we went through abuse. I call what we went through torture. Years of horrific abuse inside this well-kept central Massachusetts home felt like torture to the young foster children who... Everything's coming to light. You want to talk to us about all the abuse? Get out of here! You have anything to say for yourself? I don't know what you're talking about. They were innocent kids. <laughs> they took everything from us.
John Williams was just seven years old, his brother Nathan only three, when they were placed in this licensed foster home by the Department of Social Services, now known as the Department of Children and Families. They're coming forward as adults and working with five investigates to expose the failures of the system that robbed them of the loving childhoods they so desperately needed. And you look back at this, how would you describe your childhood? But I was never really a kid. I don't know what it's like to be a kid. Um, I'll never know what it's like to be a kid. Records we obtained show John and Nathan telling police, social workers, and others of the physical and mental abuse they suffered at the hands ready, of their former ready, foster mother, who was a registered nurse, and her live-in boyfriend in the early 2000s. Police reports detail the horror. The boys telling officers they were beaten while naked with a pillow over their heads to stop them from screaming. Court records show Nathan told others they were deprived of food, then force fed, and sometimes locked in a room or put in dog crates for hours. I'll never forget when uh, all the times that I was hog tied, tied up in a diaper, uh, thrown in a dog cage. Uh, after school was, uh, was punishment. Uh, jumping jacks naked, both me and my brother together, uh, standing with books held out. I mean, I slept on plywood. Uh, there was a bucket for me to go to in the bathroom. John and Nathan were just two of the six children placed in that foster home by the state. We've connected with them all, and as adults, they're still haunted by the abuse. Some struggle with mental health issues, substance abuse issues, and two have even done time behind bars. I honestly felt like I was going to die. Nathan Williams, aged out of the foster care system, ended up homeless and raped a teenage girl in 2013. He's 25 years old and behind bars at MCI Norfolk. He takes responsibility for his crime, but says the abuse he suffered in foster care is partially to blame. It's hard to look at myself sometimes and, and know what I've done, and I'm sorry for what I've done, truly. And I try to better myself every day because of, uh, because of that. He told us the trauma from what happened to him as a child destroyed him. He would throw us outside in the middle of winter. You know, I'd be naked. And I remember he had this um, big detergent bottle that he filled with water. And he put it outside with me while I'm out there shivering naked. And he'd bring me inside and put me in the uh, tub full of ice cube and make me sit there. And if I moved, then he'd beat me, you know? And then he'd sit there and he'd laugh as he'd pour the detergent bottle on my head. Take it with a glove and rub it into Nathan's face. In this police report, John said his foster mother's boyfriend smeared dog feces on his brother when Nathan didn't clean up after the family's dogs. Psychiatric records say Nathan was even forced to drink his own urine. The boys said they were both routinely beaten with the metal buckle of a dog leash and more. I remember him hitting my brother so hard, my brother. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. How? My brother looked dead in the face. They're heartless individuals. It wasn't just beaten. He basically treated me like a slave. In the end, it wasn't a teacher, police, or a social worker who stopped the abuse. It was John who, at the age of 12, got off the school bus and kept going, running away from home through the woods to a friend's house and telling all to police. That led to a dozen criminal counts of assault and child endangerment against his foster mother and her live-in boyfriend. The children were never allowed to testify. That's because the prosecutor spoke with the DSS attorney and the social worker and says that they would rather not have the children testify and that the children are in foster homes. So their voices were never heard, the case never went to trial, and the couple struck this deal with the Worcester County District Attorney. As long as they completed probation with no issues, they stayed away from the children, and that the foster mother signed over all the rights to the children, then all of these charges would be dismissed. What's gone through my mind, uh, as I now am a young man, is how disgusting this whole situation was sickening. It's sickening.
And even after John escaped the home and reported the abuse to police, documents show it was several months before DCF removed the remaining foster children from that home. We didn't identify the, the abusers at the center of this case because they were never convicted or criminally charged for most of the allegations. New at 7 tonight, the warning signs of abuse in that home that were missed or overlooked again and again. Kathy Carton, 5 Investigates. Powerful report, Kathy. Thank Former State Senator Nancy Schaefer and her husband Bruce were found dead today. I'm convinced without a shadow of a doubt that our the parents across this country need to be warned of the dangers of the Child Protective Services nationwide. Tonight, GBI crime scene investigators are at her Northeast Georgia home. Department of Child Protective Services has become a protected empire. They're searching for clues that might tell them it's built on taking children and separating families. What led to the sudden and violent deaths of Miss Schaefer and her husband? A family is going to have to be destroyed in order for the uh, one world government to completely develop. Preliminarily, looks to be a murder-suicide. Children are being taken away from their parents uh, in a ruthless kind of behavior. How do you tame child protective services? It may be only by closing it complete and starting over at the beginning with pro-family values. Department of Child Protective Services has become a protected empire built on... Y'all making this video quick, cut to the point, man, because TikTok keeps taking this video down. I don't know what the hell's going on, but it keeps doing this over and over. It's not even uploading, so I'm making it three minutes. I had a 10-minute long video, so if I say some stuff in some holes, just comment for me, and I'll cover it up. So, CPS and family court is not for the, fa not for the children or their well-being. Therefore, to keep them in the cycle. I had an associate that worked inside, of like a, I'm talking about high up in the company, that worked inside the family court and CPS. One day, they, they, they came in complaining that they wanted the child to be with, the, with her father because the father had a better household. Of course, she had to pay child support. So she was broke. She was The lady was broke. Uh, she was a twerker. She was a stripper. She go to the club all the time. Uh, basically, like, like the average today single mom, right? And she was a good woman. Like She, was, she really believed that the system was for us to help us. Uh, they, CPS there, they helped to help the family, uh, help the kids. You know, you know family course there to help the kids, right? So one day, she talks with her boss. To the boss, I want this child to go to daddy because we can have him in this case. He got a good home, it's going well. As she's talking about all the good stuff with the father, he looks at her like this and starts smiling. And then he says, Let me tell you something real quick. We are a business. This here is a company. We need revolving customers. We sell data. It froze on me again. We sell data to prisons. So we can know our track. The reason these prisons are getting bigger and in more space, overpopulation. No, they're getting ready for the next generation. This man said, why would we think about this? This statistics on single moms raising the worst children on earth. The most murderers, rapers, killers, child molesters are mostly from single moms. Why would the system know this statistic, know what's going on in the homes, still continue to give the child to the mother? Because she will open a revolving door for them. Most won't make it out as civilized human beings. Most won't make it out as productive people. If I give them to the father, most likely our money stops there. That kid most likely won't be in the system again. That kid most likely won't be needing our services in the future. Why would we put something out there that we can't make money back off of? Why would I not give the, the prison, the funeral homes, the government, and when they get in the system, a chance to make money when we make it money off selling data to them? When we make money off when someone goes to prison that used to be in our system, we make money off that. Same how the states pays the prison for every head they have. But that's why it is, guys. Like this, this, the, Especially uh, the, the child courts are not for the child's well-being because they did. They are mostly given to the father. It's the truth. It's really him. Really You're a victim. Mm. Here we go, CSI. Former State Senator Nancy Schaefer and her husband Bruce were found dead today. I'm convinced without a shadow of a doubt that our the parents across this country need to be warned of the dangers 
of the Child Protective Services nationwide. Tonight, GBI crime scene investigators are at her Northeast Georgia home. The Department of Child Protective Services has become a protected empire. They're searching for clues that might tell them it's built on taking children and separating families. What led to the sudden and violent deaths of Miss Schaefer and her husband? A family is going to have to be destroyed in order for the uh, one world government to completely develop. Preliminarily, it looks to be a murder suicide. Children are being taken away from their parents uh, in a ruthless kind of behavior. How do you pay child protective services? It may be only by closing it complete and starting over at the beginning with pro family values. Control deprivation describes the act of not giving an individual their desires, wants and needs in a deliberate way to control that individual. One, this is often achieved through acts such as lack of affection, acts indifferent and detached, failure to respond, emotionally distant, deliberately withholding sex, shifts blame to the individual and other techniques. Control deprivation can lead to a wide range of effects, such as causing depression, two, leading people to aggression, three, increased social class effects and the use of social stereotypes in making judgments on people core, as well as product acquisition. Five, lack of control over a situation can significantly affect a person, changing the way a person thinks and acts. This is often exploited by individuals, businesses and in other situations, however individuals are also very capable of finding alternative means to regain the control that was previously lost in regaining personal control. 6. Contents. Definition Edit. Control is the ability to influence and direct behavior or events. 7. While deprive is to stop and prevent something from happening. 8. Control deprivation is for an individual to use their power and influence to prevent an action that will give another individual joy, whether this action is emotional, physical or any other action. Effects of Control Deprivation Edit Effects on Depression Edit Systematic control deprivation can lead to depressive disorders. 9. A study highlighted how parental affection less control was one of the factors that lead to depression later on in life. Using 125 patients that have been classified suffering from depressive symptoms under DSM-3, as well as suffering from one highly controlling parent and one parent low-care parent. The results of this study show that people with depression are more likely to have seen themselves as having over-controlling parents. These effects of psychological abuse from an elder can lead to feelings of guilt, separation, fear and anxiety. 10, 11, further the studies into learned helplessness reveal that in both animals and humans when submitted to unavoidable pain eventually became normalized to the pain, even when given the opportunity to avoid the pain. 12, through the lack of control that the subject is submitted to they develop depression-like symptoms. 13, the direct lack of control that an individual experiences can directly links and cause lowered self-esteem, anxiety and a lack of motivation to change the situation that they are currently in. 2. All of these symptoms are often characterized and found in people with depressive disorders. Control deprivation can make the feelings of helplessness worse and exacerbate these feelings. The lack of control will may result in the individuals feeling more depressed and can change the emotional thought process of the individual, resulting in a negative mood. 14. These feelings stem from uncontrollability that control deprivation brings into someone's life can trigger the symptoms of depression and that of learned helplessness as a result of the control deprivation. 15, 16. Social Effects Edit. Research has demonstrated that individuals that have suffered from control deprivation are more likely to use negative social stereotypes and connotations when making judgments on individuals after having been deprived control. 4. When subjects were asked to describe an individual the subject was more likely to use negative social stereotypes when describing certain people in jobs that can be considered of lower socioeconomic class jobs. In a set of studies, subjects were asked to describe a comedian and an archivist, one set of people were subject to a scenario where they were control deprived, this treatment group were more likely to describe the archivist in a negative manner relative to the control group. 
this causes particular issues through racial stereotyping as well as social class effects. Studies have highlighted how institutionalized stereotypes within social classes may be exaggerated through lack of control 17, as well as further straining the relationships between social classes 18, highlighting that the desire for control may lead worse in social settings. Ostracism is strongly linked to control deprivation due to humans' desire for companionship and friendship. 3. Using ostracism to be able to control for control deprivation A study found that when people have the opportunity to be aggressive to the people that ostracize them they will be. The study allowed the subjects to give hot sauce to the people that ostracized them, these subjects gave four times the amount of hot sauce than the individuals in the control group. A lack of control has been proven to be related to aggression, this is theorized as people may become more aggressive to regain the freedom and control that they had lost or as a method to release frustration. 19. Individuals will use aggression as a method to restore their personal sense of power. By allowing the subjects to give out hot sauce, the amount of hot sauce given out can be seen as acting out in an aggressive and frustrated manner, both with the intention to spite the individual that subjected them to a situation where they lacked control 20, as well as to personally feel as if they are able to regain the control that they had lost. 21. Ostracism may directly cause these effects that will lead to aggression due to the lack of control. This is further similarly linked to frustration aggression hypothesis. Information processing edit. When deprived of control an individual will process information in a more systematic manner. 22. Through giving subjects unsolvable problems to create a control-deprived situation, followed by needing to pair words from sentences after a waiting period. Subjects from the experimental group were able to better recognize previously paired sentences as well as facts and make judgments on texts. The authors explore that these results highlight that failing to control outcomes is a built-in danger signal leading to a greater focus. The discussion moves on to these implications in motivation tools and how to get the most out of someone. Through the use of paired sentences the study was able to show that the subject takes in the information when encoding the information during the time that they are control deprived, they are not forming the links between the sentences when recalling the information. 22. However other studies have conflicting measurements, in another study subjects were given 0, 1, 2, 4, 6 or 8 either solvable or unsolvable tasks then told to complete a two-letter cancellation test. 23. This study found that the subjects had increased motivation to complete the tasks, however the accuracy of the tasks completed fell. The author discusses how these results may be caused by learned helplessness, which describes how mental disorders such as major depressive disorder can be caused by control deprivation. 24. Product Acquisition Edit. People more strongly linked to situations where they are able to feel stronger connected and influenced. These feelings are compounded when people are suffering from control deprivation. In line with the compensatory control theory, individuals will resort to a wide range of strategies to regain control. These strategies do not have to be linked to the source of the control deprivation. 25. Individuals will aim to complete different or unrelated tasks that the individual is able to gain control over. A study where subjects were asked to complete simple meaningless tasks of deciphering a stimuli within visual noise allowed the subjects to regain control through completing simple tasks that give a reliable and desired outcome that reaffirms a level of control that was previously missing. 26. 25. This is hypothesized to be effective in restoring mental strength as it provides evidence to the individual that they are able to influence the world around them and that they do have an intrinsic level of control and belonging. 25. 27. As a direct result individuals are more likely to purchase and consume products that link to their intrinsic need for control. 28. The study, conducted by Charlene Y. Chen, Leonard Lee and Andy J. Yap focuses on how control deprivation can be used to entice the subjects to purchase products. Through the running of multiple experiments, the study found that individuals after being submitted to a control-deprived situation are more likely to purchase a utilitarian products over a hedonic product, this is hypothesized to be a method to be able to regain the control that had been lost through being deprived, 28 with the utilitarian product being picked to represent more control that is missing as well as the long-term use and effectiveness of these products 29 however this study fails to make a decision on if the purchase of these problems does actually allow the consumer to fail as if they have gained control. Individuals with higher self-control are less economically drawn to the purchase of these products. Individuals where they both feel to be in more significant and stronger control are less likely to consume goods without a sense of need. 30. Showing that as the amount of personal self-control depreciates the desire to consume and will compensatory consume goods. 31. This shows how advertisers and advertising will aim to capture these elements to appeal to their market. 32. 
styles of thinking within cultures edit. Different cultures and still different ways of thinking about issues, East Asian people through cultural factors and education favor thinking in holistic manners, while people raised in Western countries are more likely to have an analytical style of thinking. 33. In brief settings of control deprivation East Asian subjects were more likely to shift towards an analytical style of thinking, this is paired with Caucasian subjects also continued to think in an analytic manner studies show. 34. However, after persistent control deprivation the thought process changes. After prolonged periods of control deprivation the thought process of the individuals from East Asian countries returns to the largely holistic thought processes. 34. The thought process is not dependent on static outcomes of cultural influences but change and are flexible towards the current situations such as submitted to control deprivation 35-34. Overcoming control deprivation edit. John Mayerowski proposed that problem solving can significantly improve the feelings of control that an individual feels. This is backed up by the studies conducted by Bukowski, after submitting the subjects to unsolvable tasks followed by solvable tasks, these subjects were able to quickly restore their sense of control. 36. As Mayerowski states that people with perceived higher control of their lives are more likely reflect their life constraints and opportunities, the sense of control increases with education, wealth and status of employment. All these factors show that an increase in activity that relates to problem solving and results in a sense of achievement help to overcome the feelings of control deprivation. 37. However, in the same vein, research has shown that small experiences of lacking control can increase the motivation and increase the effort expenditure to get out of those situations. 38. Through this restoring of control individuals will have had their cognitive ability boosted. 39. Uses in torture edit. Control deprivation has been used by the CIA, and described in the CIA interrogation manuals, under the detention section the manual says they can deprive the prisoner of sleep, wood, water as well as depriving individuals of sensory stimuli, can be effective in getting the information out of individuals. 40. References Edit. So what is fair use? Fair use is a case-by-case -case test found in copyright law. When met, it allows a use of a copyright-protected work without permission. For example, using a quote from a book in an article may be a fair use. The fair use concept is central to copyright law and helps promote freedom of expression and innovation. Let's look at some basic concepts. There is no formula to ensure that using a particular amount of a work will qualify as fair use. Also, it's not as simple as declaring, I think my use is fair. While the law gives some examples of things that are traditionally fair use, not all uses that fall under these categories are actually fair uses. And some specific uses that do not fall under these categories have been found to be fair uses. Fair use is a case-by-case -case inquiry. We have to analyze each use of a work. Essentially, fair use asks us to think through our actions. Federal law sets out four fair use factors. The first evaluates the purpose and character of the use. An educational, non-commercial, or transformative use is more likely to be considered fair. A transformative use adds new purpose, meaning or message not present in the original, as opposed to merely replacing the original work. A use that merely replaces the original use or purpose of the work is less likely to be considered fair. The second factor considers the nature of the copyrighted work and will favor fair use if the work is factual or previously published. Here, consider copyright's purpose to encourage creative expression by providing exclusive rights to authors. The third factor evaluates how much of the original work is used. In addition, pay attention to the importance of what was taken from the work. 
Are you using a lot of the original work or the heart of the work? Taking too much when not necessary is less likely to be fair use. The fourth factor analyzes whether the new use harms the existing or potential market for the original work. Fair use requires an analysis of all the facts and factors. The factors may point in different directions and may not lead to a clear result. It is important when thinking about fair use not to jump to conclusions. Only a judge can make an official determination of fair use. This usually happens during an infringement case. Sometimes it can be hard to rely on fair use, especially if there isn't a lot of case law available. Finally, if you don't know if a use is a fair use, you can always ask for permission from the copyright owner. If you decide to rely on fair use, be thoughtful and deliberate and keep these core points in mind. To learn more about how fair use is applied in different situations, visit the Copyright Office's Fair Use Index.